Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hewitt Shaw, the President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. We have a very special program and very special speakers at today's forum who I am delighted to introduce to you. We welcome today Franz Velzer Most, the Music Director of the Cleveland Orchestra, and Isabel Troutwine, a violinist with the Cleveland Orchestra, and the founder of a community music program for young children known as El Sistema at Rainey. We will hear from Franz in conversation with Isabel about his views and passion for music education and the role orchestras play in our communities. A native of Linz, Austria, Franz has achieved international acclaim as one of the world's leading conductors through his leadership of the Cleveland or Orchestra, long regarded as one of the elite of the world's premier orchestras, and with his leadership at the world's largest opera company, the Vienna State Opera. Franz became the Cleveland Orchestra's music director in 2002. He and the orchestra demand the highest standards of artistic excellence and service to the community and serve as global ambassadors for Northeast Ohio. He has led the orchestra in 11 international tours in Europe and Asia and has launched ongoing residencies in Miami, Vienna, and New York. Nearing its centennial in 2018, the Cleveland Orchestra's longstanding traditions demand a leader of intellect, discipline, and devotion to the role of music in our society. Franz not only embodies those qualities, he is also a leader with a vision for the future. Under Franz's leadership, the orchestra returned to performing uh, frequently at high schools, college attendance at the uh, uh, concerts is skyrocketing, and this week, for the first time in the orchestra's history, Franz has invited the Cleveland Orchestra's youth ensemble to rehearse and perform side by side with the Cleveland Orchestra, a remarkable experience for these young musicians. Under Franz's leadership, the orchestra continues to set new standards for programming and community engagement. On a personal note, in my role as a trustee of the Cleveland Orchestra, I've had the privilege of conversations with Franz where he compellingly discusses the principles of organizational excellence and connectivity to its constituents that are informed by his leadership of these world-class ensembles, but have application well beyond the world of music into many other organizations. So from that, I know that you will find today's conversation compelling and interesting. I'm also pleased to introduce today the moderator, uh, Isabel Troutwine. A German-American, uh, German Isabel hails from Alabama and moved to Germany at age 12. She has been a member of the first violin section of the Cleveland Orchestra for 11 years. In 2011, Isabel founded El Sistema at Rainey, an intensive after-school music program in collaboration with Cleveland's Rainey Institute. It is modeled after the National Venezuelan program, El Sistema, an initiative that emphasizes community-based orchestra training at a young age with a focus on making music fun and inspiring young musicians with a passion for music and for life. Please join me now in welcoming Franz Velzermost and Isabel Troutwine for what promises to be an inspiring discussion of the role of the orchestra in the music education in its community. Thank you so much, Mr. Shaw. It's truly our privilege to be here today at this venerable forum for free speech. And congratulations to you for this institution, which is so beautiful. And I'd really like to start off by thanking so many of our orchestra friends who are in the audience today and Barbara Robinson for sponsoring this series. It's very special to be amongst our family here today. Music education is a topic which is truly timely and urgent. We do know that in public schools and in public education right now, music and arts budgets are struggling, if not being slashed. And at the same time, major research points to the benefits that music has for people virtually at all stages of life, from early infancy to old age. We know that it has powerful and profound benefits for us. So 
What role does an orchestra play in its community? I'd like to start this conversation, Franz, by asking you a question. You've spoken many times in the past about the importance of music education in our communities and the obligation that orchestras have to commit to music education. I wonder which aspects of your early childhood education played into these beliefs you have? You know, um, I grew up in Austria in a typical, I would say, Austrian family. I've got four siblings. We all, and I emphasize that now, had to learn an instrument, uh, and which was not always fun. Uh, but my parents thought that it's simply part of, of the education and every one of us had to do it till the age of 16. And uh, I'm the only one who stayed with it, sort of. Uh, <coughs> my siblings uh, have successful careers in medicine and other uh, areas, but uh, for me, it, it, the most fun for me when I, when I think back was actually not the violin lessons and piano lessons. It was actually when I could play together with other kids. And playing a little chamber orchestra, that really got me going. And I, I was excited by that. Um, I was never, I, I never had the dream to become a soloist or something like that. I, I also didn't have the talent for that, um, but uh, I remember very well, it was not clear to me what I want to do in life. Music was just a part of it. And then at the age of 14, I went to a, a special school, or let's say my parents put me into that school, <laughs> uh, simply because they didn't quite know what to do with me. and. Um, and it was like a light went on. It was a school, uh, a sort of college type, with a, an emphasis on music. So I was amongst other young people who actually wanted to make music together. And uh, so uh, that's where, where I formed for myself for the first time a dream where, where I thought, okay, I want to become uh, a member of the Vienna Philharmonic, second violin somewhere in the back. That was my goal. <laughs> I didn't make it to the back of the second violins in the Vienna Philharmonic. Now I sort of stand in front of them. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it was really that feeling of, of achieving something together which, which really got me. That's actually exactly what happened to me as well. At eight, I went to a music camp, and my mother was not there to tell me to practice, and it was so much fun. And that, <laughs> and you that, know, it's, it's, it's like in, in, in my childhood, uh, I'm now going to share a story with you, uh, which just shows you how far I've come. Uh, I, coming from a typical Catholic, Austrian family, uh, my father thought that we started all learning an instrument at the age of six. And we had, uh, my siblings and I, we all had the same teacher. It was a grumpy old nun. <laughs> and she actually, she was also mean. <laughs> and so we, we were really scared of her. And I remember I was seven years old, and I, it was a hot day in June, and after school in the afternoon, I would, I would go to my violin lesson. And uh, I got, I entered the room, and you could cut the air because of all the sweat of angst of uh, <laughs> the children before me. <laughs> and, um, and I had a three-quarter violin at that time, and I started scratching my violin, and I felt more and more ill. <laughs> and 
And so uh, I threw up into the violin. <laughs> while play and uh, I haven't done it since. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just, just to tell you, I mean, that was no fun for me. Uh, and I didn't do it on purpose, even though I was a naughty child, but I didn't do it on purpose. Uh, but it, it just, I, I'm telling this story simply because uh, only a couple of years later, when, uh, when I started to play in a little orchestra, I really discovered what music is about. It was not about being afraid of a teacher and getting punished and all that. It was actually about enjoying something with other people. Enjoyment is one thing, and I think I love what you're saying. I think music at key moments in human history has actually played an even more powerful role in bringing us together, um, both in times of tragedy and in times of celebration. I'm sure we all remember the role that Barbara's Adagio for Strings played for this country after the 9-11 disasters. It really helped, helped us try to digest what had happened. Um, and in a time of triumph as Germany became reunited and Leonard Bernstein quickly brought together an orchestra of international musicians. Um, it was a powerful symbol of brotherhood of Germans who had never actually seen each other before. Um, do you believe that this ability that music has, not only to, when we play together, to avoid the terrors of being one-on-one -on -one with sometimes not very sensitive teachers, but um, much further than that, the ability of music to bring us together, to share instant communities across all language and cultural barriers, that this maybe is the most powerful argument for education today? I, I would say, I would say the two big arguments. And uh, one is, is what, what you're hinting at is social skills and, and uh, emotional intelligence. Um, it's, it's something when, when I, I look back on, on my uh, personal history in music making, um, it, you have to develop social skills if you want to play together with somebody. It needs discipline. It actually requires that you take your ego back and, and you, you actually go into a real deep, also emotional, if you want, conversation with somebody else. But um, I think when, when it comes to what, what I actually learned from, uh, from some people here in America, and some of them are actually in the audience tonight. Uh, sorry, I'm maybe still on chat lag <laughs> this afternoon. Um, is that you have to look at the uh, broadest picture possible. And when, when I look at Europe's history, um, and we are right now sort of preparing in Europe for thinking about 100 years since World War I, and what that triggered in the 20th century. One of the things which it triggered in Europe was actually slowly then and, and uh, rapidly after World War II, thanks to um, the help we, we received from America, was actually that Europe got uh, culturally uh, more Americanized. So when you look at our society today in the Western world, I think that um, we have to ask ourselves the question um, if we are in front of getting, and don't get me wrong, uh, Asianized. And I believe very strongly that what music education and other education has to do is uh, making people creative. I, I love to call it 
education to its creativity because we, we know that also from science that that is exactly what it triggers in the, in the brains of, of uh, children when they, when they deal, when they make music, it actually opens a door to its creativity which you need in any job, in any life if you want to be successful. So I'm sort of uh, not only here but also in, in Europe, I'm running this campaign that we are shooting ourselves in the foot um, as a culture but also when it comes to how we go on as a society, also when it comes to business, we are shooting ourselves in the foot if we take away education to its creativity from children. And, uh, and we should not be surprised that uh, that's also why in, in a speech I, I gave for the 200th birthday of uh, celebration of 200 years of the Musikverein in Vienna where I asked that very question and people were sort of bothered by that. Are we going to be Asianized in the Western society? And that is not a racial comment at all. It's just an observation and if we go back into uh, the little part we are talking about uh, of culture, the music education. I had a conversation one and a half years ago with the famous Chinese pianist Lang Lang. He's a rock star in, in China. He has 11 million followers on Twitter in China only. <laughs> and the Chinese government took a decision about a year, uh, two years ago, that every child in China not only should be, has to be exposed to music education. It was forbidden for a long time in China, but I think they have come to realize, or in, you, you find the same thing in, uh, or similar thing in, in South Korea, you, you have to, to uh, think that these people have realized that actually uh, education to its creativity is for the long-term future of a society and, the, and of a culture and not only important role but it's essential. So that's the de-Asianization de of Asia? No, it's, <laughs> no it's, I, I, I don't think it is because it's, it's not about uh, pushing away, uh, I, I believe, it's not, not about getting rid of Asian music, it's just about saying there is a way uh, the classical music as we know it is an international language and it is something, and you know so much more about Venezuela, what they have done in the last 25, 30 years that uh, why is it there that they want to play Beethoven? And Beethoven is a German composer. The Viennese think he's Austrian. Uh, <laughs> but actually, it's international music. And that's the point. And, and it, it's a, 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 uh, a climax, if you want, a, uh, which a civilization has reached. And to give that up free willingly, I think is, is uh, f sorry for being that blunt, I think is stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what classical music brings, I, f personally I wish we would just simply get rid of genres because <coughs> as the great Miles Davis once said, there's either, either bad music or good music. <laughs> and I know from working with children, they make absolutely no distinction between the different genres. They either like the tune or they don't like the tune. And I think actually, for honest, most of us probably feel that way. Um, so what classical music, symphonic music, however, can do, and I think this is what you're hinting at, is it alleviates spiritual poverty. 
spiritual poverty I would characterize as being a sense of alienation, depression, separation. It affects people across the economic lines. It affects people at all ages. And I think in this increasingly digital age, maybe that's what you're alluding to with Asianization, we have a lot more time that we're at home alone with our electronics. We're not necessarily going out to concerts, to dances. We're not, we're not spending as much time as we are here right now with one another. And we are the most social of all beings. The only way to alleviate spiritual poverty, and this is what El Sistema's core belief is, is in community building. And the classical symphony orchestra is simply the largest team on earth where one conductor can conduct 800 people playing a Tchaikovsky symphony. Everyone on that team is a winning member of the team. It is what the founder of El Sistema, Jose Antonio Abreu, calls a, a society of agreement. And that is its beauty. I believe that by being part of a community, being an important member of a community, you know, there's only one principal oboe, there's only one timpanist. You, the minute you enter the orchestra, you are an invaluable part of that orchestra. And that is where I think this might be what you're getting at. This is where the incredible affluence of spirit can come from when we have either large orchestras or large choirs. And it brings me straight to something you said last night. Um, we, last night, the Cleveland Orchestra staged its first community showcase concert. Over 300 musicians shared the stage at Severance Hall. It was an idea you had, beautifully executed by Joan Katz, our education director. Um, you spoke to the audience, and you said that you would like to see Cleveland become a city of music makers, which I feel very inspired by. And I, I think, I think the beauty in that, in my imagination, is that people would gather around this language of expression. It's the only language humanity knows that you instantly understand. You can travel today to Indonesia and not understand anything of the written or spoken language, but you will instantly feel the spirit of the music you see. And Cleveland, as many cities, we have large cultural divisions. We have a very segregated, culturally segregated society as well as economically, which I'm sure we're all aware of. But by coming together around music, a lot of healing can take place. And I wanted to ask you what, what you see, where your hopes are for Cleveland making music. You know, I, I believe, uh, first of all, I, I would like, because you, you talked uh, about the concert last night, I want to, uh, get rid of one cliche which also is out there about young people that the attention span is shrinking. We did an education concert on Wednesday morning and uh, you know before I walked on stage it was really noisy in the hall because there were 1,400 kids or whatever you know 10 to 12 I think of age and you know how they are, lively, and uh, to say the least. And the second we started to play, it was quiet. And that attention lasted really for 50 minutes. And they were really into it. So, and we, we didn't, we played music by Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev, Bernstein, and it was all connected. A, a story was told about Romeo and Juliet, and, you know, it grabbed them. And, and so that was the perfect proof for me that it's not about the attention span, it's actually about the quality and, and about the passion you put in front of them. And, and I think uh, what I said last night to the audience that my vision is that entire Cleveland makes music. Um, I have to explain what I think a vision is. A vision is something where you try to reach for the impossible to achieve the extraordinary. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm realistic enough that I don't think, uh, let's say, five years down the road, everyone 
in Cleveland will play an instrument or sing in the chorus. But you have to set a goal, and you have to go for that. And, and that's what, what, what we are trying to do. And, and I think beyond that, I said that two years ago in a meeting, I said, when you look at Cleveland, where it is as a city, you know, coming from a small country, uh, when it comes to different markets, we cannot, Austria has 8.4 million inhabitants, uh, we cannot compete with the masses of China, India, Japan, America, uh, or even in, within Europe with Germany or Great Britain or France or Italy. But where you can compete is you have to find niches and you have to be the best in that niche. And I believe that Cleveland has all the components uh, to be sort of the musical city of America. And, and it goes hand in hand with a famous name in, this, uh, in the history of the Cleveland Orchestra is Robert Shaw. And when he, he was probably the most extraordinary chorus master in this country's history. And when he left Cleveland and, and, and went to Atlanta, a lot of people from the Cleveland Orchestra Chorus at that time went with him to Atlanta, looked for jobs there, just to be able to sing still with that man. Which sort of, if you put all these components together, you say, there's no reason why people, if, if we can achieve that, that Cleveland becomes the American city for music, that people want to move here because of that, because of extraordinary music education, because of extraordinary music making. Absolutely, community. I think for that, we'd have to really also address the access piece. Um, private music education to learn an instrument is expensive at this time. I know that from working at Rainey, uh, when it's time to even rent a violin, that's not easy for some families. And then a string breaks, God forbid, that's $20. So, my passion, of course, as you know, lies in making music education accessible so that the talent or the desire or the passion, whichever um, attracts the child, can, can really be developed no matter where they come from. Um, I, wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you lastly about the, the exact way that a community could be engaged in music making. Do you see choral components here or instrumental or do you see um, you know uh, perhaps choral programs where people work extensively together or more sing-along gatherings the way we ended the concert last night what are your visions in that way you know I, th I think there are many things you can do uh, but you know somebody who sort of beats a rhythm on the table makes already music so uh, it's, I, I learned that, I, I remember when I was music director of the London Philharmonic from, from 1990 to 96, we went twice to South Africa, which was uh, exceptional in those days. And for me, the most fascinating experience there was, was actually watching four-year-old uh, young uh, girls and boys, how they're feeling for rhythm and how, what, what they would do, you know, with a little stick, uh, just uh, drumming, you know. So I, I think there are many, many possibilities. We, we tried in the last couple of days to uh, get out uh, to, to the community a vision where we want to go. There will be many steps to instead. We, I'm not saying that we have figured out everything, uh, you know, uh, but when you set a goal, you figure out ways how to get there. But uh, for sure, I mean, what, what we did last night, and, and I'm very proud that a lot of uh, audience members actually did sing along. Uh, 
even some of them an octave lower, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's about the experience. It's about the experience, what it feels like. My wife, uh, who was listening last night, and she said, um, you know, it's actually difficult to sing that. You know, you know the hallelujah out of the Messiah, of course, but it's really difficult to sing that. She tried it. Um, I don't know how well she did, but uh, I was far away uh, at that moment. But I, I think everyone in the audience got yesterday the experience what, what it means to make music together. And, and we will definitely build on that, you know, there the are possibilities when, when we do public square. And, but I'm, I'm sort of talking about the snowball effect. And one thing will come to the other. And as I said, you know, 10 years down the road, we might be all back here and sing together. Who knows? <laughs> Good. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring music director of the Cleveland Orchestra, Franz Felsermost, in conversation with Isabel Trotwein, Cleveland Orchestra violinist and founder of El Sistema at Rainey. We will return to our program momentarily for the traditional City Club question period. Please formulate your questions now and remember to be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to 90.3 WCPN IdeaStream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations on which we are broadcast across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Closed captioning of our programs is made possible by the Nordson Corporation. We would like to welcome guests at tables today hosted by Baker Hostetler, the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra Education Committee, PNC, and the Women's Committee of the Cleveland Orchestra. Thank you for your support. We also welcome students today from the Cleveland School of Arts and Montessori High School. Student participation in today's program is made possible by the Charles E. Spar Charitable Trust. Will the students please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Today's program is the Larry and Barbara Robinson Family Foundation Forum made possible by a generous gift from Larry and Barbara Robinson. Joining us today at the head table is Barbara Robinson. Will you please stand, Barbara, to be recognized? Now we would like to return to our program for our traditional question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests, holding the microphones today, our development and marketing associate, Michael Cromaldi, and program director, Carrie Miller. May we have the first question, please. Welcome, Maestro. <clears throat> when I grew up in the 1940s, the Cleveland Orchestra was known as having the best woodwind section in the whole United States. George Zell was particularly uh, working on the, the accuracy and the ability of the players, but he also wanted the perfection of acoustic sound within Severance Hall itself. Later on, Yaya Ling founded the Cleveland Youth Orchestra. My question is, if I were standing in front of a music appreciation class in the year 2030, what should I list as your particular legacies to the city of Cleveland? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm only part-time American. <laughs> um, I simply say that because uh, it's, there's a difference still, even though Europe, as I said before, got more and more Americanized, uh, but there's a difference in, um, in Europe 
or at least where, really where I come from, also with my family background, and America when it comes to the word legacy. Um, the way I was brought up, that's not something you think about. It's um, you have a challenge in front of you, a job to do, and you try to live in that moment and you try to make the best of it. And legacy, to my understanding, means what other people are going to say about you, which you anyway cannot influence. <laughs> uh, what, what I would wish for is that in 2030, that my vision of Cleveland as, as America's music city number one will have come true. And if that is the case, then uh, I would be happy beyond belief. Ah. Um, hello. Mr. Rosenbaum. Long Rosenbaus. time no see. Yeah. <laughs> um, he played yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to say it was an honor playing with you uh, yesterday. My question for you goes along the lines of education again. Um, for the urban cities and the segregated city we live in, like you said yourself, I was fortunate enough and some of my friends to be exposed to classical music and therefore get to the positions that we are now, Koyo, Cleveland Orchestra, Youth Orchestra being one of them. But my friends outside of the musical area who think they know about music when the only genre they know is hip hop, um, they don't really appreciate it and they say, oh, that music's boring, where actually it's not really boring. It's a little bit more complicated than hip hop, which kind of imitates Gregorian chants. But I mean, so what, what would be your, what is the reason for this lack of appreciation or knowledge despite segregation in these urban communities? I, I think that uh, it all has to do with uh, like what you said about yourself, uh, that children have to be exposed to it first. How should they know about it if they've never heard of it? I, I remember uh, two high school concerts extremely well. One was here in Cleveland uh, in a very difficult area. I, I don't remember the name of the high school. Uh, Sean Adams, uh, and you know, it was a very difficult crowd, and uh, we played Rite of Spring, and uh, actually one of, one of these girls, when I talked to her, she said, because I invited them to dance towards the end of, of our one hour program, just come up with something. And this one girl said to me, you know, I still prefer hip hop. But having said that, she acknowledged that actually it wasn't all that bad what we played. <laughs> and the most touching moment for me came afterwards when a, when a um, young, about 14 years of age, African American, African American came up to me and said, where can I learn the violin? And that after Rite of Spring were, you know, it's more on percussion and brass and all this. And I thought that was a very touching moment because uh, it made a difference in his life. We made a difference. And, and I believe it's like what we experienced on Wednesday morning uh, or I remember one high school concert we did in Miami where there was a crowd. They never ever had heard symphonic music in their lives before. We, we played Beethoven five, and afterwards 153 or something like that wanted, wanted to come to a concert we gave two days later. 
So it's it's really a matter of exposure, and that's what were were actually uh, what what I've been saying that we we have to to try to get that out. It's our responsibility as a community, everyone who is in here, in this room, it's our responsibility to carry that out and say, listen, people, actually, it's, it's music which goes beyond sort of easygoing entertainment, if you want. It's something which can give meaning to your life and, and is emotionally really fulfilling and so uh, that's what, what all this is about. And I think in my experience, and I grew up in, in a system which actually is, is uh, rather close to El Sistema, uh, where, where I went to school and so on, the way we made music and, and took it into poor neighborhoods and into factories and so on. And it was interesting, uh, as soon as people got quality and passion, they immediately embrace that. And, and so uh, I think it's actually not that difficult. We shouldn't expect people immediately to jump onto it, but first we have to expose them to it. Uh, Mr. Moyes, uh, it almost seems like uh, ancient history today, but uh, 30 or 40 years ago, the number of women in the audience at Severance Hall uh, was probably at least half, maybe more than half. But if you looked at the stage when the Cleveland Orchestra was performing, there were very few women in the uh, Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, I can remember the harpist, Alice Shalifel, probably the only woman. Uh, that, of course, has changed very dramatically, and uh, uh, Cleveland Orchestra uh, proudly, uh, look at the first violin section, more than half of it is composed of women today. Uh, and even the Vienna, Vienna, Orchestra, Vienna Orchestra, one of the very last ones to accept women, probably about 20 years ago. My question is, uh, enough of that looking back, but looking ahead, uh, what could you see of a similar major change that might occur in, uh, in, in classical music and orchestras during the forthcoming years? Um, first of all, I'm happy that you don't ask me about the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, <laughs> Having been on tour with them, I had that question now uh, enough times. Uh, but I think when, when I look at uh, youth orchestras, uh, it's what it's going to be in 20 years down the road or 30 years in uh, professional orchestras. Uh, because that's where we recruit people from. And like the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra, which uh, the members of, of the Mahler Youth Orchestra are from all over Europe, basically, you hardly find any male in the violin section anymore. It's changing. I'm, you just have to look at it. Demographics change, and uh, you know, with also with uh, the influence of what, what is going on in Venezuela and other countries. They just started something like that. I know of that in Peru, and in uh, other countries, uh, they have a program like that in Scotland. Uh, there, there are a lot of countries where, which sort of look at that and, and start that. That will change um, also the, the makeup, the personnel makeup of, of uh, great orchestras. Uh, in the Berlin Philharmonic, 10 years ago, nobody ever would have thought that they would have members uh, in the Berlin Philharmonic being born in Venezuela. They have two now. So it, it, it's changing. It, it actually is an, uh, somewhat also an artistic challenge uh, because everything gets more internationalized, globalized. So how do you preserve or nurture even 
certain um, specifics uh, of like this orchestra, the Cleveland Orchestra, or in another case, the Vienna Philharmonic. Um, that's a, a question for, for the music directors to figure out. Uh, but it, it is a changing world, and, and I think that 30 years down the road, there will be many more different phases in symphony orchestras than 30 years ago. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for your inspired vision for our children and community. I'd like to hear from both of you as to what you saw as the unique power of the El Sistema program and what your vision is for it growing in its scope in Cleveland. That's your question now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you for that question. And I think it speaks out to, to your question. Music will be, uh, but those people who will excel in music are the people that are exposed to it and have access to the education necessary. It's a very time consuming and um, resource consuming education if one wants to become a member of a symphony orchestra. So what is unique about El Sistema in Venezuela is this access piece in virtually every village. And I had the privilege of traveling for many weeks, which almost I don't think anyone gets to do, to go to the farthest reaches of that country and see that even the smallest villages have outstanding music schools that are free of charge to all the children in that village. Uh, they, the way it works is that the touring orchestras are, are a life they consume the entire life of the people that are members of the Simon Bolivar and some of the very famous orchestras that tour around the world. When the young people get tired of that, they are encouraged, paid, <laughs> to go back to their villages where they grew up and bring this cultural education that they received in these outstanding orchestras to the tiny villages. So it's, uh, they are really not encouraged to leave Venezuela, which is a whole other topic. Um, but many of them actually feel very patriotic and obligated to stay in Venezuela. So directly what is invested in the youth that reach these outstanding levels goes back to the villages. So I would say that that combined with the daily exposure that children go to for three to four hours a day to play in orchestras, having very good teachers every day of the week, um, that is unique. And I think for Cleveland, what I'm seeing is one of the biggest problems in the inner city is that life is very complicated for a lot of the children. Um, there are changing housing situations. There are economic circumstances that just make sim relatively simple seeming things, such as transportation, nearly impossible. So some of our, even our very dedicated youth, one girl, she's so talented for violin. She came almost an hour late yesterday to our dress rehearsal for our Severance Hall concert because her mom got off from work late and couldn't afford not to stay. And, you know, it's just complicated. And so if we can solve some of these problems that have to do with access here in Cleveland, I think that the, the power and the transformative power of children being part of music communities will be unstoppable. We just have to really put our brains to the exact things that might keep, keep the children who really want this away from the intensity of the training that they would require. Hi. Um, in your discussion of exposure, I was reminded of the many times I've taken tiny size instruments to preschoolers. And of all the times I've done that, I've only had one child who didn't try out the violin. And it was more because she was shy and holding on to the teacher's skirts. But I stood up really to ask you the question. I know, Isabel, you're aware that I do free violin lessons in East Cleveland. And I'd like your advice, as much as you can provide it, the two of you, on how to expand and um, popularize a program. I think one of the things to really get away from is to think of this as something strange for children, because it's not. Any caring adult coming into a community with something they feel passionately about and offering their time to this community to bring something extraordinary will have success, especially with children. They're 
they are so open-minded. The second thing you have to do is find people like Brittany Kubiak. Um, she's our violin teacher at El Sistema de Rainey. She's a graduate and a passionate music educator, and I think she thinks 26 hours a day about how she can best explain to children um, what, what the details are of, of our work at Rainey. So great teaching and early exposure, I think, are a recipe for success. Now, of course, it requires tremendous amounts of time. <laughs> that might be the thing that would hold some of us back. But if, if you're willing to do those things, the children will come like magnets. I like your concept of Cleveland being the music city. Um, and I can think of three or four other places that I know of personally where music has been a economic driver and a social driver. And I'll just cite them quickly. Asheville, North Carolina has developed a real music culture around mountain music and bluegrass and actually has a very good orchestra too for a small community. Um, Nova Scotia, particularly the Cape Breton area, has developed a whole music culture around uh, Scottish fiddle playing and the basis for that and some spread off of that. And then of course there's Nashville, uh, Tennessee, which is Music City USA and has actually, I think, trademarked that name, uh, which is known for country music. So what are the things that those communities or others you could cite have put together that make them a music-centric community and it could be both the cultural and creative and economic drivers you're citing? You know, um, I, I think that I, I sort of hinted at that early on. Um, Cleveland has when you compare it with, with other great American symphony orchestras, it's sort of a miracle that in Cleveland there is this extraordinary symphony orchestra for many decades already. It only got there because there was a, uh, a really passionate, devoted community. It's not because of one music director or two music directors or whatever. It was a community which really passionately believed in that. And um, so I, I think this is, is one very important component. Uh, the Cleveland Orchestra is regarded as the Rolls Royce of symphony of American symphony orchestras, and uh, we try to live up to that uh, every single day. Um, I, when when you know the music business, which is a small business, uh, you know it's not. Again, we are into categories, unfortunately now. But but classical music is is a small business compared to country music, you know. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, I believe when, when you look at, at the real freaks uh, going wherever it, it takes them to hear this or that performance and so on, I, I think that there's a real opportunity for us here to make people come to Cleveland. And uh, as I said before, I, I think the, the education part plays uh, a big role in that, and, and that's why we have made it a focal point of, of our institution. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Franz Velzermos, music director of the Cleveland Orchestra, in conversation with Isabel Troutwine, violinist and founder of El Sisteme at Rainey. Thanks to both of you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.
WPNC is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts of City Club Forums is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation.